Hello, everybody, and welcome to the fourth episode of Kato's Anime Cafe, where every Monday we sit down and discuss anything and everything anime. I'm your host, Hoodie Song, and today's episode is brought to you by the Tax Defense Group. Due to the global pandemic, the deadline to file your taxes for 2019 was pushed back to July 15th, 2020. If you haven't filed for 2019 yet, there's good news. The Tax Defense Group can e-file your taxes for you. The process is quick, and for millions of people, you will get money back. So, what are you waiting for? Call the Tax Defense Group today at 800-850-7973 to get started. That number again is 800-850-7973, and you can visit them online at thetaxdefensegroup.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Writer Junkie. Are you thinking about starting a business or a side hustle? For all businesses to be successful, you need a website. Writer Junkie offers website development, content writing, and SEO services for business websites. Call Writer Junkie today at 805-587-7966, and you can visit them online at writerjunkie.com. Again, the number is 805-587-7966, or visit them online at writerjunkie.com. Thank you to the Tax Defense Group and Writer Junkie for sponsoring this week's episode. Let's get back into it. So this week we were going to do something a little bit different where we were going to review Japan Sinks, which is Netflix's new anime by the Devilman Crybaby director Masaki Yuasa, um, which is an adaptation itself from from a novel in the 1970s, which became a film franchise, etc, etc. It's a big thing in Japan. We were going to review it because there was a lot of interesting discourse happening around it about, you know, did this live up to the hype? Is this great? Is this anime of the year? Is this actually a big miss? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It was going to be a good review. We watched all of the episodes in one night in preparation for this review. Unfortunately, we suffered from extreme, bizarre, frankly absurd level of technical difficulties with my internet going out every five minutes, uh, Zero's headphones dying at the most inopportune times, uh, the inability to get. Uh, Skype working, a number of delays in trying to finish this anime on time, so on and so forth. It was a real big issue to try to put this together, and ultimately, it is now 6 p.m. on the day this is supposed to go up, and we are still unable to record. So we bit the bullet, decided the only way this would work is if I just did a solo recording session. Now, that's not ideal. We do like the conversational form of our usual reviews. If you are a fan of our channel, you may be aware of our uh, Patreon-sponsored series called uh, Cato Reviews, where, much like what we had planned, we, we spend 30 minutes just having a conversation about whatever anime we just watched. That is how I prefer reviewing video uh, reviewing anime. Unfortunately... Technical limitations, technical difficulties, just leave us where we are. That said, we did watch this entire anime, so uh, I'm still here. I'm still going to review it. Again, this is going to be full spoilers. We're going to be talking about every little thing, including the endings and character deaths and so on. So if you haven't seen the anime and that's spoilers are something you care about, uh, maybe take a pause, go put on Netflix, come back when and tomorrow night when you finished it. It's only 10 episodes long, and then you can enjoy the review with all that context. And if you don't care about spoilers, then let's just jump into it. So Japan Sinks is a novel that came out in the 70s, which is uh, a bit of a, uh, not necessarily the first from my understanding. I don't know too much about this and it's kind of hard to find information online because for as important as it is in Japan, it's really not something we've experienced too much of here in the West. But basically it's the story about earthquakes in Japan. And as the name describes so aptly, it is about Japan sinking. Now, what's interesting from what I can gather based on limited research that I've done, what's interesting about this version of Japan Sinks is that it follows a family that did not, from my, again, from my understanding, based on what I know, did not exist in that original novel. So while this is an adaptation, it is interestingly unique. It is very much from, again, from what I know, Masaki Yuasa's creation. Now, I want to open up with general thoughts because the reason we even decided this was a good idea, beyond just general interest in this director and in a new Netflix anime that seemed pretty good based off of trailers, the reason I wanted to talk about this specifically and why we tried to rush out this review is because I found a lot of weirdly negative discourse online. You know, there's a lot of talk about how this had so much potential and how it looked so good and how the trailer was really good and then ultimately how it just became a huge miss and how the, you know, it made weird choices and it just fell off really, really bad and um, ultimately it wasn't that good. And on the other side of the spectrum, I saw so many people talking about how this is anime of the year material. Now, the interesting thing about Masaki Yuasa is that he has another anime out this very same year uh, called uh, Keep Your Hands Off of Isaac... Isaac? Uh, I'm 
forgetting about the exact uh, pronunciation of the title. Anyways, it's a really, really fantastic show. I've only seen a little bit so far, but it really is unique and very clearly has potential to be anime of the year at the end of 2020. So the potential for Masaki Yuasa to have two phenomenal anime coming out in the same, you know, short time frame was really, really interesting and I had a lot of people's eyes on it. So it was surprising for me to see so much controversy, not in the sense that like anything happened, just in the sense that people were very torn on whether or not the show was actually good, that I felt compelled to just, all right, well, usually I don't get to the stuff the day it comes out. I'm not usually that quick of a response, but you know, this seemed interesting enough to just grab my attention. So in reaction to that controversial discourse, I actually found myself really impressed. Japan Sinks isn't without rocky parts, and there were times where I lost faith that it could stick the landing because of all the things I've heard, and the small moments that I thought weren't great to me felt a lot heavier because I was prepared for it to suddenly fall off the wayside and become terrible. But in the end, with the whole series behind me now, I thought the good far outweighed the bad, and if it didn't stumble every once in a while, to me, it really did feel like this could be anime of the year material. There are still things I didn't love, and there are still issues we're going to talk about here, but by and large, I thought this was pretty great. So first, I want to start with what worked for me. The first two episodes are, in my opinion, some of the best anime I've ever seen. I think the way the show opens up, particularly with the first episode, I was getting teary-eyed 15 minutes in when the main character, this daughter, she's, you know, this track star, she's just watched all of her friends die in a terrible, terrible earthquake, she escapes injured and is running home, and what we learn about her in the first few minutes is that though talented, she is the ace of her team and, and is, is going to be nationally recognized by the time she turns 18 and possibly perform for her country in the Olympics. Though she is really, really talented, she struggles to go all out in practice. This is, this is the first thing we see of her, is her coach saying, you need to dedicate yourself more, basically. And watching that character run home after this terrible, terrible earthquake and trying to muster strength to, because she injures her leg, so it hurts her to run. But trying to muster that strength and energy to keep running, to get to her house and see if her brother's fine, see if her dad's fine, see if her mom's fine, to see her family alive again, watching her crouch or like hunch over and just a simple, a simple almost throwaway line where she just says fight and then she runs off again. To me, at that point, I was already crying. Through such incredible tragedy, they do an amazing job of empathizing you to not only her, but to the other characters as well. This whole family, in my opinion, by the end of episode one, you are crying for. You know, there's this whole moment uh, where she is struggling to find them. The house has been torn down by the earthquake, and there's they're in this little center, uh, like a schoolyard, where everyone's trying to find their family. She's yelling out, no one's there. She can't find anyone. She's worried. She's worried they're all dead. And she looks up and she sees the lights from her yard. Her dad is this amazing electrician, I guess. And he was known in the neighborhood for having these fancy multicolored lights up around the house. And all the neighborhood would just look at them and they were very beautiful. But it was kind of embarrassing because it drew a lot of attention. But in this moment, she looks up and she sees the lights hanging from the tree. And she knows, that's my dad. And the relief felt in that moment. The excitement excitement is a weird word because it seems happy it's a very somber thing because there's a lot of death around her that's the thing about this anime is that it is gruesome i don't want to use the word gore because i think gore evokes this idea of like ripping off limbs and you know fights where people rip eyeballs out and that's not what this anime is but it is bloody it is about tragedy it's about earthquakes and it's you know it shows people dying in national uh, natural terrible terrible events so that is one, you know, so that would, would be one precursor I'd give is like, if you're, if you can't deal with some death and some violence, not necessarily person to person violence, but you know, na natural violence, then uh, maybe this isn't for you. But in that moment where everyone is so war torn around her and she's looking up and she sees the lights and runs to her father, to me, that was such an emotionally powerful moment. And it was only less than 20 minutes into the episode, less than 20 minutes into the very first episode. I was so incredibly impressed. And then there was a scene where the son, who is the youngest in the family, is home alone and the earthquake hits and he is hiding under the table and he realizes, he hears this uh, corporeal voice of his father who says, 
in an earthquake, when you're at the bottom of a building, you need to get outside. He listens to that advice and he tries to make it outside, but the earthquake hits again and he gets stuck. And then he's trying to just survive. He's trying not to get crushed by everything. And there's a moment right before it cuts to black where he gets slammed in the back by like a chair or a table. And I remember physically wincing when that happens because in the short time we've known this boy, I don't want to see him die. You know, this sounds simple. Of course you don't want to see characters die. But when there's a level of disconnect where it's like clear that you're watching an anime, it's not super emotionally impactful to see people get killed. I mean, think of how many random background characters you see get killed in Naruto or whatever. For me to be so attached to these characters so quickly, I think is such a testament to the level of directing and writing and soundtrack put on display in these first couple of episodes. You know, the character work is so impressive, and especially by the end of the show, where it's like any character that lived, I don't know, past episode 7, in my opinion, was awesome. There are characters that didn't stick, there are characters that, you know, came for a couple episodes and then left, and there are characters that died that I didn't necessarily care for, like the the big one is the grandpa in a sort of the middle half of the show, where I... You know, he there was some stuff there, and I did feel a little bad, but ultimately he came and went, and it didn't really bother me all that much. There are some that are like that, but by and large, the people that ended up living, our core cast, you know, we had the daughter, the mother, the kite, the YouTuber, the son, and the older runner boy. When we had that small cast, each death from that point on felt so, so heart-wrenching. There was one where it was the runner boy, it was... He, he had to run out into the like this little aisle in the ocean and had to grab something and return it. And they knew he could not do this. Even in his prime as like the most successful runner at their high school or whatever, he probably couldn't make this. But right now, out of practice, there is no injured. There is no way. And he does it. And we get this backtrack of uh, announcers basically shoutcasting this as if it were an actual race and you see this character who has been a shut-in who has been in a depressive slump basically who's finally found purpose or he's finally you know at least got out of his slump and he's he's just trying and it was so so sad to see the wave slap against him and to you know i mean he just dies it, there's a moment afterwards where they're waiting like he can come back he could swim back to the shore and they just and they occasionally you know cut back to the ocean and you're just praying you're hoping to god that his head is just going to pop out the way the show makes you hope it makes you pray and wish i think is so powerful it created a sense of verisimilitude that i don't think i experience from anime all that often it had me believing it had me so in the moment that these deaths felt real, and it felt like, I just want them to live so bad. You know, even as early as, like, the first three episodes, I wanted that first first earthquake we got to be the only earthquake, because it was enough to already destroy and kill so much that each subsequent earthquake, I was like, no, not again, please. Because I was so scared for these characters, I was already coming to love. Another death that I thought was fantastic was the YouTuber Kite, who I mentioned earlier. You know, the show has great animation all around. It reminded me of Ping Pong a lot, which is one of my favorite anime, one of the best anime ever, in my opinion. Um, and the animation in particular around Kite's death was so raw, so ugly, but in the best way. Basically, he gets into this weather balloon, this uh, balloon that, like, when it gets high enough, it would connect to the internet and it would connect his phone, it would give his phone a Wi Fi signal. And he gets up there, and the way they showed how cold it was, how his face was distorting and blowing in the wind, and how his eyes were squinting in, in pain, really, pain from the cold, and how he was shifting his hands, just rubbing them for seconds at a time, trying to muster any amount of heat he can to just keep holding on and hold on for as long as he can just to get that signal. I thought it was so powerful. You know, uh, I grew up in Boston, in New England, and I'm not going to say I've ever experienced cold as bad as Kite would have felt in that moment. But New England is pretty cold. It's probably the coldest place in America at times. And I have distinct memories of walking back from school in blizzard-like conditions where I'm holding 
something in my hand and I'm trying to cycle which hand is in in the pocket and which hand is out and it's seconds at a time. You're basically giving your hand a second to regain as much heat as it can in your pocket before it has to go out and brave the cold again. And it hurts. It hurts so bad. And that memory it was able to pull on for me, that pain and fear of the cold it was able to pull in that moment and seeing Kite persevere regardless and seeing that confidence that Kite displayed as a character so on so much before, I thought it was such an emotionally powerful death. And none of this is even talking about the mom or the dad or not like an older sister, but an older sister figure that had all died, who were all great characters in their own rights and also died. This show is rife with death, but at the same time, maybe not all of them, but a solid 80% of them means so much despite that. It's not a situation where you think, okay, they're all just going to die, so I'm not going to care. They're all going to die, and despite knowing that, despite realizing that it will only hurt you to care, you can't help it. The show pulls you in. It makes you love them. So that's what worked for me. Among other things, I obviously didn't talk about every character. There were a lot of characters that I loved. I didn't talk enough about the daughter. I thought she was amazing. I thought she was the best character in the show. And I didn't talk about the parents who, in their own rights, were also fantastic. By and large, that's what worked for me. What didn't work for me was the pacing. You know, it's interesting because the show is 10 episodes. You know, when, when we talk about anime, you know, I'm listen, I'm not the most... I'm not as deep into the fandom as most people. I haven't seen as many anime as most anime fans have. But when I think of anime, I think of a season being 12 episodes or a season being 24, 25, something like that. When something comes along and breaks that mold and goes for something like 10 episodes, it feels deliberate. Now, obviously, there have been other anime before that have been tw uh, 10 episodes. There have been anime that aren't 12 or 24 or 25. I understand that. My point is just that... By and large, those are the regular numbers. So to see someone go for less than makes me think, okay, this is what they wanted. This is specifically what they thought was best for their story. Of course, there are always going to be other reasons. When all is said and done, money is going to be the biggest factor in most cases. And without knowing the exact reasons behind all the decisions made, it's hard to really comment too much on it. All I will say is that I don't feel like 10 episodes was the right number for this series. For me, the show's biggest problem was the pacing was moving at such a breakneck pace. It was way too fast at times, and I think the biggest indication of this was in the sort of middle mini-arc where we get into this utopia-like city, I think it's called Chin City, we get into this utopia where everything is great and it's being led by this woman who claims that she could speak to the dead. This is classic cult apocalypse survivor stuff. It's very common in apocalyptic uh, stories to have this great society that's led by this uh, monolithic figure who is basically manipulating everyone. The interesting thing about Shin City, about this mini arc in Japan Sinks, is that this woman actually is what she says she is. She proves beyond the shadow of a doubt that she can speak to the dead when our main characters give her an item, and she says something that she would not have been able to know anything about that means something to us. So we know for a fact that this woman can actually speak with the dead, and yet we only ever spend two, maybe three episodes in that city before it all goes down, and that woman ultimately dies. This felt like the most underserved couple of episodes in the entire anime, in a sense that I almost wish they didn't exist. Because it presented such interesting questions and such interesting elements to the story that ultimately felt like they didn't matter at all. They brought some interesting things. There was a character that, or a couple characters they introduced through this arc, and they're not irrelevant to the story. There is stuff here, but by and large, it felt like instead of being two or three episodes, it should have been six. It could have been an entire season of a different show. I don't think I don't think Japan Sings is going to get another season. I think this was a very specific story that was being told. It was a limited series type of deal. But if this was a multi-season multi type story, if, I think a whole season-long arc would be about this one utopia and exploring the politics behind it and why this is working and why it will ultimately fail or not fail and 
who is this woman and what is her power and what is this weird thing with this son. All of it was very intriguing and ultimately left without being tied up. We don't really get anything to resolve this, in, in my opinion, in an emotionally satisfying way. You know, I think about the uh, climax of that arc where she is, her, her kid just died and she's standing over his dead body, resolving to live in his honor or, or something. And uh, her followers come up, a, a small sect of her followers come up and they say, you know, we want to die here. We don't want to escape. We want to die with you. And then they all presumably get crushed by the building as it collapses. It felt like the show was asking me to feel sad. Maybe not sad, but it was asking me to feel something. And ultimately, I just felt nothing. I felt no attachment to any character, to not a single character in that scene. I didn't know any of their names. I didn't know anything about them. I knew one of them was a psychic. I knew one of them was presumably her security slash lover. And then one was her dead son. And I didn't care about who they were beyond that. And I barely cared about them at that level. To me, this felt like the biggest failure of the show, and I think, but I think it was a microcosm of a larger issue, which was that at times it just had weird pacing. The interesting thing about it is, though, when it's all said and done, that breakneck pace ended up being kind of its savior. You know, in the moment when I was watching those episodes, I felt not connected to what's happening. I think things are rushed, but in hindsight... When I've now finished the entire 10 episode series, these moments kind of fall to the wayside. I don't even really think about them much. If I wasn't writing, or not writing, if I wasn't giving you this review right now, I probably wouldn't even be talking about it. Because they come and go so fast, I kind of just forget about the problems. I think in a year from now, when I think about Japan Sinks, I'm going to be thinking about all the things I thought the series did really well. I'm going to be thinking about the great characters. I'm going to be thinking about that ending where the main character, the daughter, loses her legs, but ha loses her leg, one leg, but has a prosthetic and is still complete, uh, competing in the Olympics. Uh, and the son, uh, he becomes an, an esports athlete. Very modern. <laughs> uh, perhaps a bit too modern. Uh, he becomes this successful esports athlete. And I think about the triumphant feelings I felt in that moment. And... I, th I don't think I'm going to think about that utopia arc. I don't think I'm going to think about Shin City. When, in the moment, it felt so bad, they came and went so fast that it's actually not as big of an issue as it felt. The other notable thing that I will say felt a little bit of a weaker aspect of the series was uh, on a thematic level. You know, themes are always existing, and... The show definitely had some that I'm sure someone could make interesting videos about. It's not as my complaint isn't necessarily that the show had weak themes or that I don't like the themes, but rather I think the themes were never delivered to me in a way that I felt resonated emotionally. You know, stories can say things, but ultimately, in order to be receptive, the viewer needs to be invested. It needs to be uh, able or willing to listen. Otherwise, why not just read an essay? Why not just listen to someone deliver a lecture on that exact same idea? The benefit of stories is the idea of uh, the audience caring. They will care in a way that they wouldn't care for a lecture or an essay. And I, like I said, I do care a lot about these characters, and I do care a lot about the story and their survival. But whenever it felt like it was trying to tell me something, suddenly I felt like I didn't care. And I wasn't interested in the characters they wanted me to care about in order to learn the theme. Where I felt that, where I felt this wasn't the case, and where it actually ended up uh, working the best, in my opinion, was this weird rap scene in one of the final episodes, where the remaining surviving group of people are all sat down and they're sulking and they're miserable and they're kind of just reflecting on the losses they've had along the way and kite the sort of uh you know makeshift leader of the group starts playing a song and he starts freestyle rapping and then he calls on the son to let out his feelings in a freestyle rap and he does and then he calls on the older kid to start uh freestyle rapping in response and then he calls on the daughter and everyone just has this rap circle 
and I think for a lot of people, this probably won't work. I think a lot of people might even cringe at this. And maybe this is just the musical theater nerd in me. Maybe it's because I just watched Hamilton um, and I'm on a rap high or something. I don't know. But for me, this worked so well. I felt moved and I felt like I understood these people in a way I might not have before. You know, it's not realistic in the sense that these guys are way better freestyle rappers than most people have any right to be. They're not, like, amazing or anything, but they're way better than someone who's never done it should be. And I know if you're watching this review without having seen the show, this sounds weird and out of left field. But in my opinion, for me specifically, and maybe if you are like me, it worked so well. It was a wise, empathetic character using music to break tension and get everyone to open up and... I think it landed really solidly. So I guess in closing, for my thoughts on Japan Sinks, I think ultimately I would say it was really great. You know, I didn't look too deep into the specifics of other complaints because I did want to go in spoiler free, but I'm really interested to know what other issues people had with the show because despite every stumble and pacing issue, at its core, I thought Japan Sinks was a powerful, inspiring story about a girl and her family surviving an incredible disaster. It made me feel triumphant. It made me cry. It made me laugh. I think it made me feel in ways that not every anime is going to make me feel. And yeah, it had some issues, and I'm not going to ignore those, but I think by and large, I thought it was really, really fantastic. So if you have six hours to kill and uh, just need an anime to watch, or if you are specifically someone who seeks out discussion of interesting shows, I think Japan Sinks is at the very least interesting. Even if you don't like it, I think it's interesting. I think the way it fails could be an interesting thing to discuss, and I think the way it succeeds, in my opinion, uh, overshadow those failures. So if you have six hours to kill, go check out Japan Sinks on Netflix. I think that's going to do it for this week's episode of Kato's Anime Cafe. I want to give a quick shout out again to this week's sponsors. Thank you, Writer Junkie and the Tax Defense Group for sponsoring the Anime Cafe. And thank you to everyone listening. You can catch us uploading every Monday to UCAS Studios' YouTube channel or your favorite podcast apps. I'm your host, Woody Song. Until next time. Sayonara.